Hello, we are back with another one of Mr. Deeping Science Lessons. For today's session, you're going to need a book and a pen. And in your book, you need to get down today's title, which is Adapting to Change. And for your Star Trek activity, I would like you to calculate the mean and median average of this data set, which shows the lengths of five swordfish bills, which we refer to as the sword. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. You need more time. Pause the video. And when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have we got those averages? Let's have a look. I'm going to start off with the median average. So I want to put my data set in numerical order. So starting at the bottom, 35, 39, 41, 43, and 47. The one in the middle is this 41 centimeters. And that is my median average. To calculate my mean average, I'm going to need to add all of these together. And when I do that, I get a total of 205 centimeters. But then I need to divide by how many pieces of data I have in my data set. So I've got five pieces of data in my data set. So I take that 205 centimeters, divide it by five, and that gives me a mean average of 41 centimeters. In this case, my mean average is the same as my median average. In today's lesson, we're going to be stating the resources that animals and plants compete for. We're going to be explaining how genetic variation helps plants and animal species to survive, as well as describing how some behavioural adaptations help species to survive in different habitats. So what do animals compete for in the wild? They compete for water, they compete for food, they compete for mates so that they can reproduce, and they compete for shelter and space or territory. So what do plants compete for? They also compete for water. They also compete for food or nutrients. They compete for light, which they need for photosynthesis, a reaction that occurs in the leaves, which allows our plant to make its own glucose. They also compete for space. And when we talk about space, we tend to be talking about the space that the roots grow into because the more space that your roots occupy, the more water and the more nutrients you can absorb. And so, for our next task, what I'd like you to do is to copy and complete the summary paragraph using the words which are down the side. And if you really want a challenge, you can suggest how a cactus can photosynthesize without any leaves. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock, and if you need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. All right, if you finish your paragraph, let's go through it together. So plants and animals compete for a number of resources, and these include water and space. And those two are interchangeable. So if you put space and water, that's also correct. Animals also compete for food and mates to reproduce. Plants make their own food by photosynthesis, and so they compete for light. Organisms have a number of adaptations that enable them to survive in their habitat. Next up, we're going to be looking at some of the adaptations that our plants and animals have. So if you've had a go at the challenge, you can see whether or not your suggestions are correct. So now we can state the resources that animals and plants compete for. So how can a plant survive in the desert? Usually, the leaves on a plant will result in water loss. But the cactus has spines instead of leaves so it doesn't have this water loss problem. But that does generate another problem for our cactus, because leaves are usually the site of photosynthesis, where our plant would make its own glucose. And so it does its photosynthesis in the stem. Another problem that our cacti face is that it has very little water. And so to get around this, it has very widespread roots, so that when it does rain, it can absorb as much water as possible. Some cacti have roots which reach down all the way to the water table so they can absorb water from there instead of waiting for it to rain. Also, our plant has a waxy layer around it which prevents water loss. But what about our animals? Let's have a look at our oryx. Now, usually animals would sweat, which results in them losing water. Our oryx doesn't sweat. Another way in which our animals usually lose water 
is by urination. Our oryx has very concentrated urine, which means that it's reabsorbing a lot of the water as it passes through the kidney. Our oryx has very long, thin legs, and usually this would mean that it's very difficult to walk on the sand. But oryx has very wide feet in order for it to get more traction. And another problem faced by our oryx are the high temperatures in the desert, as well as the really cool nights. But the oryx has a very large body, and so it takes a very long time for the oryx to get to temperatures which would do it any harm. Also, when it's at a very comfortable temperature, when it gets cooler in the night, that large body also means that it cools down very slowly. So it never gets too cold during the night time. So now let's have a go at describing how the following plants and animals are adapted to life in the desert. At this point, we should all be able to do the oryx and the cactus. And if you really want a challenge, you can have a go at the camel. Feel free to set this out as a table with three headings with each one of your plants or animals as one of those headings and list the adaptations under each one. I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. You need more time, pause the video, and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you got all of your adaptations? Let's start with our oryx. Remember, our oryx doesn't sweat. Our oryx has very concentrated urine, which means it's reabsorbing a lot of that water. Usually it's difficult to walk on that sand, but our oryx has very wide feet. And to be able to thermoregulate properly, it has a very large body. In order for our cactus to prevent that water loss, it has spines instead of leaves. But then it needed somewhere else to photosynthesize, so its site of photosynthesis is in the stem. In order to survive in a place that has very little water, it has really widespread roots or really long roots so that it can absorb a lot of water when it rains or so that they can reach down to the water table. It also has a way of preventing water loss even further by having a waxy layer which coats the cactus. So now let's have a look at our challenge, which is the camel. Now the camel lives in a very similar habitat to our oryx. So it's probably gonna have many of the same adaptations. Our camel has a very large body. This allows it to thermoregulate just as well as the oryx. It also has wide feet for increased traction on the sand. Our camel also doesn't sweat. It also has concentrated urine, which means that it is reabsorbing a lot of that water in the kidney. And our camel also has a hump of fat on its back. And this fat can be broken down into water and energy. So our camel can go for really long stints in the desert without water. So now we can explain how genetic variation in our animals and plants help them to survive in their habitat. Next, we're going to look at some behavioural adaptations of animals and plants which enable them to survive in their habitat. So how do plants cope with the seasons? Well, in the autumn and winter months, it's a lot colder. And when the leaves fall to the floor, it actually insulates the ground, keeping the roots of the plants warmer. Also, in the autumn and winter, there is a lot less light. And so when our plants lose their leaves, this also means that our plant needs to expend less energy keeping the plant alive, because it doesn't have to keep the leaves alive. Now, this isn't as wasteful as it may seem, because as these leaves decay, then our plants can reabsorb the nutrients from these leaves. Now, when it gets a little bit warmer and wetter in the spring, then our plants tend to have a bit of a growth spurt and they grow all their leaves back. Also, in the spring and summer, there's a lot more light. And because our plant had this growth spurt, there is a lot more leaves. So our plant can carry out more photosynthesis. But how do animals cope with the seasons? Animals like the bear will go into a state of hibernation. This conserves energy when food supplies are low. There are some birds, like geese, which migrate from a cooler climate to a warmer climate. This is not just about moving to a place which has a higher temperature, this is also about moving to a place which has a higher abundance of food. Because in places where the temperature is cooler, the small rodents which they eat could be in hibernation, and none of the trees are going to be providing fruits, and so they need to go somewhere where there is more food. 
And then we've got animals that have a lot of fur or wool, like sheep. And in the winter months, they grow thicker wool or they'll grow thicker fur. And this allows them to stay warm in the colder seasons. Some animals as well will shed their fur in the warmer months so that they don't overheat. And so for our next task, what I'd like to do is to explain how these adaptations and behaviours help these species to survive. We're going to look at the oryx again and our oryx moves around at the night time and it stands still in the breeze. Our arctic fox, it has more visual clues. This is what the arctic fox looks like in the summer and this is what the arctic fox looks like in the winter. How is that adaptation helping that species to survive? And if you really want a challenge, we've got some penguins and they huddle together in a group and all penguins get to spend time in the middle of the huddle. How are those behaviours helping those penguins to survive? I'm going to put five seconds on the clock and if you need more time, pause the video and when you're finished, we'll go through the answers together. Have you explained your adaptations? Let's start with our oryx, who likes to move around at night and stand still in a breeze. Now, not moving around during the day and standing still in this breeze is going to make sure that he doesn't get too hot during the day. And if he does his movement during the night time, then that's going to help our oryx stay warm during the night. Our arctic fox has a dark, thin coat during the summer and a really thick white coat during the winter. And so this allows it to stay camouflaged in all seasons and it helps it to stay warm in the winter as well as keeping cool in the summer. So why do penguins huddle together in a group? This allows the penguins in the middle to stay warm. Now all the penguins will spend some time in the middle and then work their way to the outside and then they'll work their way towards the middle again. So all penguins spend some time in the middle and some time on the outside. Also, those penguins that are on the outside are going to protect all the penguins on the inside from snowstorms. So now we have also described how behavioural adaptations help our species to survive in different habitats. Which means we've only got one more thing left to do and that is our plenary. I would like you to design a creature that is adapted to living in this habitat. What adaptations is it going to have in order to enable it to live there? And what behaviours is it going to have in order to enable it to live here? And if you really want a challenge, after you've designed that creature, can you design a predator that's going to hunt your creature? I'm going to put five seconds on the clock. If you need more time, pause the video. And when you're finished, we'll go through it together. All right, have you designed your creature? I designed mine. There he is. My creature has colours which are very similar to ones that are around him, so he's very camouflage. He's got long legs, so he can go and wade in the water. He's got a long neck, so he can eat food that's in the water. He's got a long beak, which is also going to help with that. That long beak may also be able to get him some food from the soil. And with all of these adaptations, this critter is more likely to survive and more likely to reproduce. And its offspring are more likely to reproduce. And its offspring are more likely to reproduce. And that is everything that we set out to do today. I hope you've had a good lesson and I'll see you next time.